will now press record. Um, the recording will be shared with registrants after the session, but we're using a webinar format, so only speakers will be recorded. Slides will also be disseminated to everyone who has registered. Um, there is both a Q&A and a chat function. There's going to be lots of time for questions at the end because um, we really want to have a rich discussion. So please use the Q&A button to submit questions to presenters themselves. We encourage you to do that throughout the session so that we can curate those and cover as many as possible um, at the end. Um, you're also encouraged to use the chat function if you'd like to discuss what you're hearing with other members of the audience. So please use that for discussion with the audience and submit questions for the panel itself using the Q&A function. So that's all of the housekeeping. Um, as one of the world's leading edu higher education researchers, I don't think that our presenter, David Bowd, really needs much introduction, but just a few words to remind you what our session is about today. Um, in 2020, the Centre for Research on Assessment and Digital Learning celebrated its fifth anniversary, and today founding director David Bowd will take stock of what Cradle has achieved over that period and introduce colleagues who will speak to areas in which they have made particular contributions. Focus will be on the ideas that have been promoted or indeed reconceptualised by the Cradle team and how those have influenced the ways in which we think about teaching, learning and assessment in higher education. Those of you who are familiar with Cradle's body of work will not be surprised to hear that feedback and development of students' evaluative, evaluative judgment will feature prominently. And with that, I'll hand you over to David Bout. Well, thanks very much, Trina, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, the Cradle's first seminar of the year. And it's probably quite appropriate that we start off by uh, having a little retrospective about where we've come from, where we're going uh, right from the start. Um, I'm assuming that um, you don't have a huge uh, familiarity with Cradle itself. So I, what I want to do is to say a bit about what Cradle is, um, a bit about what we've been trying to do, a bit about how we measure our impact on things. But most importantly of all, I want to, and I want to focus with my colleagues on the ideas that we've been pursuing. Because I'm of the view that the main contribution of research in education is to change the way in which we see the world. So through research, we come up with new ideas, new conceptualizations, new framings of problems. And then through that, we can actually do things differently in practice. And of course, practice speaks to those things as well. So the format that I will, um, I'll be following, he said, trying to get his, uh, <laughs> slides to move forward. I just have a slight difficulty in controlling the slides. Yes, here we are. So this is um, the focus that um, I want to take throughout. So start by what, asking what Cradle is and what it does, asking how we measure impact on what we do. The main part we focus on is on the key ideas and then to end up a little with where we're going. And I'd like to uh, encourage lots of discussion and lots of questions. So please contribute to the Q&A um, as we proceed. Don't save up your questions to the end. So first of all, what is Cradle? Now, quite obviously from its title, it's a research center. I mean, that's pretty blindingly obvious. But our particular emphasis is on influencing educational practice in higher and professional education, and particularly in areas of assessment and digital learning. But there's a tension at the heart of this in that we're not just a research center. Um, if we were just a research center, then we could focus on the normal things that research centers focus on, grants and publications, and that will be our normal way of measuring our performance. But we have a, a, a tension that if we look at the normal measures of research performance, it doesn't actually capture having an impact on 
educational practice. And of course, the other tension we have is that it's much easier to get external research funding, but that funding takes us away from research that has an impact on higher education practice. So who are we? So our core, and that's supplemented by various uh, external fundings of various kinds. Our core is 4.5 academics. I'm the point five, by the way, and one research manager. Our positions are research only, but we're charged with doing research that does make an impact on teaching and learning. We come from a whole range of different disciplines, but we all have our PhDs in the area of research on higher education. And we're centrally located within the portfolio of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education, but we've got a mission to include academics within faculties as research partners in all that we do. So let's look at impact. Now, starting with the conventional grant income, I mean, although we have been successful in grant income, you'll notice over time that it is lessened and it's lessened through the, um, the disappearance of some of the grant bodies that used to fund higher education research, like the OLT. The thing that we focus on rather more is our publications and particularly our targets have more than 90% of our publications, our papers in Q1 journals, that's in the top quartile. And we've been very successful in doing that and very successful in having um, a very substantial impact over time. We also do book chapters and they vary from time to time. And particularly we've focused on books as books as, as a process of consolidating ideas on an important topic. And uh, we'll all be talking about some of those books as we go through uh, later. So I mentioned this dilemma before. Conventional research measures don't capture what we do. We've got this fantastic success in publishing and in getting recognition both nationally and internationally. But the places we can most easily get funding from are funding things which are not about higher education in the normal sense. For example, we've got funding from various medical colleges, which is about advanced medical training which is a great thing to do, but is on the edge of our area. The important thing though, is that we're very strongly supported by Deakin University for our core research on higher education. So what kind of approaches do we adopt? I mentioned before that we're highly focused on the space of assessment and digital learning, but our practice is to be highly, highly collaborative. So all the core team work and publish with each other. They all work with multiple partners and they all work with multiple disciplines. So we have layers upon layers of, of layers of collaboration with different parties to do things in different ways. We have, well, until COVID intervened, <laughs> a lot of national and international visitors and they're visitors that we collaborate with. We don't like people just turning up and saying, hello, what are you doing? We very much like visitors that work with us on a project of some kind. We've pursued the um, annual or almost annual international symposia where we focus on a new area and we focus on that new area to open it up, but also then to bring it together often in the form of a book. And we'll be mentioning some of those in a few moments. And internally, we've got various kinds of fellowship schemes which promote collaboration between ourselves and academics within the faculties across any discipline. And we've um, been very successful in getting connections across all the faculties at uh, Deakin and a very large number of the disciplines within those faculties. So let's move on to the key ideas. So what are these ideas? Where have they come from and where do they lead? Well, the thing about ideas in education is that they're not owned by any one party. 
each one of us takes an idea and pushes it further and moves it on, reframes it. And that's part of our research activity. So what, do, what are the particular ones that Cradle has been um, central in uh, pursuing? So we've got this list of uh, six here, and I'll be speaking to the first two. And the first two involve all of us um, in various ways. Um, and some of the latter ones involve combinations of us in various ways. So we're looking at feedback, we're looking at developing evaluative judgment, we're looking at self and peer assessment, we're looking at authentic assessment for work, we're looking at the challenge of the digital, and we're looking at academic integrity and assessment security. So just the start in the first one, feedback. Feedback is probably the thing that we're kind of most known for in our work. And I think all of us have contributed to this in all sorts of different ways. And the big idea in the feedback space that we contributed to is to move away from the old notion of feedback being something we do as academics to students, like we provide an input to students about their work, moving from that to a process in which students seek, obtain and utilize information about their work to improve it. So it's shifting from an input to a process and shift from a focus exclusively on what teachers do to a, a process in which different parties contribute in different ways. And ultimately, it's the effect on students that really counts. So one of the things that this involved us in doing with our partners at, at Monash in, in this particular case was to think of a new definition. And as I mentioned, to see feedback as a process, it's a process in which learners make sense of information. So the focus is on the learner and not the teacher. It's about information on their performance so that students, learners do something and they receive information from others about that. And they use that information to enhance the quality of their work or their learning strategies. So feedback is judged not in terms of the comments that are provided to students about their work, but it's judged in terms of what do students do with information they receive from various sources. And those sources involve teachers, involves peers, involves themselves, and so on. So some of the implications that have arisen from this is design. The first issue is design. Feedback has conventionally been seen as something that's attached to an assessment task. And we pay attention to the assessment task and feedback information is a kind of icing on the cake. So a company is um, assessed work and it provides extra information for students. What we've been arguing in our work is that we need to design feedback processes systematically within units and across units, and not just as an afterthought to grading. Grading students' works and providing useful information are two completely distinct processes. Conventionally, they've gone together, but we can usefully disentangle them from time to time. The second big implication from this idea is that we need to position students as active players, not just active players in reading what other people have said to them, but active players before a feedback event. What do they need from others? How can others be helpful to them of identifying that? Active players during the feedback event of attending to and utilizing information and finally after the event in terms of acting and changing what they do so that we need to think about what the role of the students are in every single one of those processes 
and by and large to move attention away from students after they've received information to focusing on students to identify what kind of things would be helpful to them. The third implication is to look for the impact of feedback events on what students subsequently do. If we have a feedback process and nothing changes, that is students don't learn anything and they don't produce better things in their subsequent work, we have not seen the feedback process in operation. We've seen the offering of information. So if we're going to take feedback seriously, we need to look at what students subsequently do and are they doing things that are worthwhile. And around that theme, one of the books that I mentioned before, we focused on that and we focused on the impact of feedback in higher education and a whole range of different people, both in Australia and overseas, came together to look at how can we focus much more on the impact of feedback events and much less on the input in the first place, of which there's a lot been written in the past, so we don't need to revisit that quite so much. And the other big implication from this is that all the parties involved, that is students and ourselves, need to be feedback literate if these feedback processes are to be effective. We need to understand feedback really, really well. And students need to understand it really, really well. And both of us need to be able to deploy it for our own ends. And that feedback literacy agenda is one that's uh, moving forward um, as we speak. So projects that have followed from that, we've had lots of different trials, multiple contexts, multiple disciplines, multiple levels of courses, looking at the new feedback ideas, how they can be implemented, how they can be uh, evaluated. We've got that book on looking at feedback effects. Um, we've just published a paper critiquing the notion of feedback in national student surveys. We looked at student surveys all around the world and found that feedback was used in the old way as input from teachers. And that actually creates problems for um, portrayal of students' evaluation of courses. If students don't think that feedback, if, if students think that feedback has nothing to do with them, then they will respond in particular ways. And in fact, do what they do, which is blame us for feedback not working effectively. We've also got a very recent um, systematic review of what works in feedback, of looking at some of the very, very best feedback um, empirical studies that have been done to ask the question, what is it in all this that is most effective? That's very hot off the press. Um, we've been developing frameworks for learner feedback literacy. And more recently, again, the latest paper on teacher feedback literacy. And um, Phil is leading a team to develop a scale to measure learner feedback literacy so that we can track this over time. So are we being effective in helping our students develop feedback literacy? And can we show that this is making a difference? And we've been collaborating with a colleague in Hong Kong to develop that scale. So that was the feedback space. The second one I want to mention before I pass on to my colleagues is the issue about developing evaluative judgment. And there's a simple idea that lies at the heart of this body of research, and that it's not enough for teachers to determine what a student knows or can do. Unless a student can do it for themselves, then they're not very effective either as a student or in the workplace. So we have employers crit criticizing universities and saying that they're not work ready. But when you actually probe that, it's not that they don't have knowledge. It's not that they don't have technical capabilities. Mainly what they're focusing on is the fact that they don't have the nous to know what is necessary to do in the new situations in which they find themselves. 
And this, we argue, points to the importance of developing students' evaluative judgment. And evaluative judgment is about um, students being able to monitor their own work, to be able to monitor the work themselves, to monitor the work of other people, and to know where they're going. Unless they know what they know and know what they don't know, then they can't be effective as a learner or in the workplace. And this positions um, developing evaluative judgment as one of the three fundamental wings of assessment purposes. And those fundamental wings are the first one is to ensure that learning outcomes have been met. And we're very familiar with that in our marketing and grading processes. And that's something that we've called summative assessment to enable students to use information to improve their learning right now. And that's feedback and formative assessment that we've talked about. And then finally, sustainable assessment, which is about building students' capacity to judge their own learning. And this isn't something that you can do at one point in time and it fixes them. It's not like a vaccination. Building students' capacity to judge their own learning needs to be integrated throughout courses, throughout programs, throughout units to build over time. And this is the definition that we came up with for our first paper. Evaluative judgment is the capability to make informed decisions about the quality of work of oneself and of others. So it's informed decisions about the quality of work. And in order to make informed decisions, students need practice in discerning what constitutes good work. So they need practice in knowing what is good. And they don't just know what is good by being told what is good. They actually have to have practice in discernment, distinguishing between things that are good and not so good, knowing how things can be improved seeing that in the work of others as well as themselves. They need to have opportunities to make judgments about their work and about that of others. So again, practice in making judgments. They need to get feedback information, not about whether they're right or not, but whether they're making sound judgments. They need feedback on the basis of their judgments and not just on whether the, the outcome is correct or not. The students should be judging for themselves whether it's correct. We need to be helping them refine those judgments. And of course, a bit like feedback, we need to design into units, into courses, opportunities for them to practice the development of their judgment over time. And this is one of the diagrams that um, uh, Joe originally structured and um, it's just a kind of way of portraying two wings of evaluative judgment, understanding what quality is and making comparisons between themselves and these notions of quality. And these around the edge are elements of that. And as you see, feedback is a very important consideration in the whole process, but it's feedback of particular kinds and to particular ends. So some of the projects that followed from that, um, identifying what teaching and learning practice contribute to developing judgment. So some are more effective than others. So things that involve students making those discernments, identifying quality, making judgments are important. We've been looking at that in different contexts, different courses, different disciplines over different periods of time. And we've been also rethinking the notion of self and peer assessment in the light of developing evaluative judgment. Some of you may have been thinking, well, hang on, doesn't what he's just been talking about sound a bit like peer and self assessment? And the answer is yes, it does, but it is reframing it in different ways. And on that point, I'd like to hand over to uh, Joanna Tai, um, who will actually follow up 
and the, the next one of our themes which relates to this. Jo. Thanks Dave. So as Dave said, um, the rethinking of how self and peer assessment fits in within a university curriculum and, and the, the, the what um, potential it has um, is one of the things that we've also been working on. And I think this work um, really draws on and builds upon previous work that Dave has done pre prior to um, the inception of Cradle. Um, but the, the main thrust of the argument here is around that students um, once beyond the, you know, the lovely environment of the university will no longer have teachers or educators to be able to tell them what is correct or what needs a little bit more work um, or what is really good. And so we need to build this capability in students themselves about how they are able to make judgments on work. And self and peer assessment is obviously the practice of making these um, judgments. And therefore, uh, the, the purpose of self-assessment is no longer one of um, perhaps, you know, reducing educator workload or making things easier or even, you know, an excuse to get students to work in teams. There is actually a justification for um, building these capabilities in students such that they are able to use them beyond the university. And so work that um, we've done in collaboration with colleagues at Deakin, um, especially Chia Dachi, um, has really been to this effect to argue for how self and peer assessment can contribute to the attributes we expect of university graduates, including things like critical thinking and professional behaviour. And of course, there is then that reciprocal um, work, uh, contribution to evaluative judgment in the sense that by practicing self and peer assessment, students uh, gain opportunities to make comparisons, to draw on a range of information sources um, to understand quality, um, but also that evaluative judgment is really uh, necessary for self and peer assessment. So those two things do require um, multiple goes across the university um, journey that students have. Um, and of course, the, um, the other part of it is that self and peer assessment um, suddenly becomes authentic once uh, students progress into the world in the sense that they will be required to make judgments uh, on work of others and to understand how they fit in with others in the workplace. Um, and hopefully that provides a nice segue into Roller's slide, which comes next on authentic assessment. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, folks. So I'm going to um, talk about authentic assessment, and it does segue from what Joe was saying in that authentic assessment does need to develop students' evaluative judgment, and it does need to do it in authentic ways. The key idea here, though, what we were thinking about is we can design authentic assessment ourselves, but do the students see it as authentic? Um, what are students' perceptions of authentic? Um, and if we think about authenticity then as something in the eye of the beholder, we sought out to understand these students' perceptions. And interestingly, what we found is that where things were misaligned between who they wanted to be in their goals, the activities on placement and the assessment, that really undermined their perceptions of authenticity. And it led to a form of instrumentalism in the way that they undertook the assessment. So it was kind of a task that they just had to do a hurdle, they had to jump. Um, so it really undermined the value of it. What we found as well is that assessment in will typically represents a narrow range of student capabilities. A lot of it is focused on written communication. Um, much of it was, you know, about reflection, but students were quite critical that it didn't actually showcase a broader representation of what they could do in will to capture the diversity of enactments and achievements that they felt that they had done within um, the placement and a classic example because we used bridge pictures with this particular project and they highlighted how in their placements there's all these activities where they communicate with a wide range of people but the assessment involved them sitting in front of a computer writing up a report and so we kind of 
where we found the, the problems with the authenticity, um, one way to improve it was to think about improving coordination between students, university and industry. And moving on from here, and our next work is kind of contemplating how we might do that practically, but also the sorts of metaphors we might think about, you know, whether it's a bridge between two practices, whether it's both practices at the same time, or other ways of conceptualizing authentic assessment that helps us to get a handle on it, doing those things that Dave said, which are around um, extending, in, um, enabling, and also um, actually assessing what they do. And with that, I will pass on to the next person. Margaret. Which is me. Um, hi. Um, so I um, am talking about the digital and really the key idea that we have in Cradle around the digital is that it's about conceptualising us learning, teaching, working, learning to work in a digital world. That's to say that rather than thinking of technology as a tool or some sort of um, thing that we use to get stuff done, either to teach or to do this or to do that, that actually everything we do now is mediated by technology. And in fact, this seminar is a perfect example of it. And there's all sorts of other things that have come into our daily lives, social media, big data, artificial intelligence. I mean, every time you use Google, there is a, you know, algorithmic support for the sorts of things and choices that you're making and making. And so how does this affect university learning and teaching? We wrote this book about reimagining university assessment, which came out last year in sort of at a very kind of timely moment, even though that wasn't planned. And the one thing I think that I could say about reimagining assessment is that it's hard. And when you see those words reimagining university assessment, they look so simple and straightforward, but actually rethinking things for a digital world is not easy. And that's why I think we need to have so much focus on it. We have um, been working with closely with um, Deacon staff. One of my roles here is to, to, to conduct um, independent evaluations of uh, Deacon strategic um, digital innovations. And one of the things I've been working, at, working on with in collaboration is to really unpack how the digital is rearranging what it means to be a teacher. How does it change how we think of ourselves, our identities, the activities we undertake, what do we lose and what do we gain? It's actually a surprisingly complex issue. Um, other things that Cradle is doing in this space. I wanted to give a shout out to our first uh, PhD graduate, Dr. Sarah Lambert, for her work on the inclusion of equity groups. I think this is a key part of living in a digital world. How does a digital improve access or, as it turns out, maybe um, dissuade access to university, to education, etc. We also have a co-tutel arrangement with um, the University of Copenhagen, which is really um, coalesced around this digital theme. And this really opens up the idea that in the digital, um, the world of work has changed. So when, a, um, when you're in a GP now, a patient will come to you with data on their phone that they've collected about themselves. Um, you might be working in a lab and suddenly the images that you're looking at in the lab are feeding into an art of artificial intelligence database about corpus of data, about um, what good practice will look like into the future. So these are all really big changes. And I think that um, there's a lot of future work here for Cradle to start to unpack what this means for us here on the ground in higher education. And on that note, on a digital note, over to you, Phil. Thank you, Digital Margaret. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm sort of building off the digital to then talk about cheating, academic integrity and assessment security. So this is a, a program of work uh, that I've been leading within Cradle, collaborating with 
a bunch of people within Cradle, within Deakin. Um, particularly like to give a shout out to Cradle fellow uh, Wendy Sutherland-Smith, who's been a key collaborator in this work. In the book on the right there, I introduce a concept called assessment security, which really comes out of sort of a split in the academic integrity work. So a lot of the academic integrity work is really positive, educative and values based, which is a really important mission. We want to promote students ability to do work well with integrity, the right way to want to do that, to be able to do that. But at the same time, we need to pay attention to another thing called assessment security, which is the need to ensure that assessment has been completed under the conditions that we set. And I guess the key contribution in this space is that these two things are important, they're intention, but they're not a dichotomy. So the, the book there on the right and some of the associated work really tries to tease out how we can both promote academic integrity and assure assessment security. Uh, some of the work that's sort of fed into this has been work in testing out some assessment security approaches. You know, things like we're all worried about contract cheating. Uh, you know, figures suggest the prevalence is around 6% uh, in terms of students admitting to have done it at some stage. Can we see contract cheating if we look for it, if we ask people to look for it, if we train them to look for it, if we equip them with special software? Uh, so that sort of work has, has been one of our foci here in Cradle in this assessment security mission. That's then enabled us to have some yeah, really useful impact into the national debate, into international debate. An example there is input into Australia's uh, amendment to the TEXA Act, which gives TEXA the powers to prosecute contract cheating firms. Uh, some of the input that Cradle's had into that has been to really make sure that it really targets the big commercial end of cheating, not the parents or friends helping a student to cheat, which is still not okay, but not something for the, the legal side of things to follow. Um, so that's been sort of an ongoing mission and we were successful there. The current uh, legislation that Australia now has makes it a criminal thing for this sort of commercial cheating, but not for the friends and family type of cheating. And sort of more broadly, Cradle's done work into the prevalence of different types of cheating. Uh, there I'm talking about Rebecca Audrey's survey in 20 languages, many thousands of participants. Uh, the experiences of, of cheating. I think we've got the only paper out there about what it is like to purchase contract cheating assignments and what the quality of them is. And that's uh, Wendy Sutherland-Smith, Kevin Dullican. And finally, the aftermath of cheating. What happens if you cheat and you get caught? What's the experience like of the people who go through that? And that work was led by uh, our student union, student advocacy service in uh, that, that's Penelope Pitt in collaboration with Cradle. So a, a range of work, but all really focused on this tension between promoting academic integrity and assuring assessment security. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thanks, Will. And thanks for my colleagues for uh, adding to the big picture. So going back to our kind of a um, little program, our final um, stage at the moment is where are we going? Um, I've taken these strategic themes. We, we, every, every year or two, we review our themes and about where we're putting our focus. And these seven are the ones that are on our current website. And I've bolded the ones that we are probably going to put renewed energy into in the future. Some of the things about feedback, workplace, evaluative judgment, assessment security, very important part of what we do and that will continue. But we're gonna place a bit more emphasis on some of these other things. Uh, for new work that we do. So here are some of the, uh, just a little, little taster for some of the things that we um, might be looking at. Um, connections between the digital and the physical. I mean, one of the interesting things that came out of the COVID experience is the experience of students that wanted a physical experience on campus uh, facing a digital experience only. And it points attention to 
how we build engagement through technology and through non-technology. And one of the issues that's coming up in the digital space is that we're becoming very much more efficient in terms of instructional design in developing online activities from which students are almost guaranteed to learn. However, it isn't just about the stuff that students learn. Students also need to be able to be autonomous and to be able to take responsibility and to direct their own learning. So there's a tension that exists between using technology to make learning more efficient and using technology in such a way that enables other goals of education to form their rightful place. And that's something which I think needs a lot more conceptual work as well as some empirical work down the track. Second area that's coming up, um, um, Joe leads leading an Ishii uh, project at the moment, and it's about inclusive assessment. But we wanted to take it a bit further than that. So what is really inclusive assessment? At the moment, we think about inclusive assessment as assessment that can accommodate students that have special consideration. But there's an awful lot of students that, one, don't apply for special consideration. They'd regard that as kind of inappropriate or it's not for me. Um, there's all sorts of different variations amongst students that a particular standard approach to assessment doesn't accommodate. So are there new ways of thinking about assessment to make it more necessarily inclusive as distinct from inclusiveness being a kind of an add-on, a fix, a special consideration that needs to be adapted for particular students with particular conditions. So what would really inclusive assessment look like? What are we gonna do in that space? I can't give you the answer to this because we're still starting to work on it. And the other area that we wanted to work on more is the representation of achievements. We've got this kind of historical um, artifact of the transcript in which we list the units that students have taken and the grades that go with the unit. And we've believed as a whole university sector that this actually represents something meaningful uh, that communicates to the world. Well, the one thing we know is that it doesn't communicate and it doesn't communicate very well. The only people that can understand what the transcript means are the people that actually generated it in the first place. We might understand what it means, but no one else does. So we need to be thinking about new ways of reporting what students can do. But also we need to be thinking of not just new ways of us recording, for example, the attainment of particular learning outcomes, which is a part of it, but much more interestingly, enabling students to portray their own achievements for different audiences in their own ways. And how can we have blends of officially validated results about student achievement with student representations of what they can do in ways that communicate to a whole range of different diverse audiences compared with what we're having at the moment. Now, these are some of the blue skies things that we're starting to look at, but this just gives you a flavor of, we've been there and done some interesting things and we're hoping to do some interesting things in the future. We might make a big Im impact on some of these and others, we might discover how limited they are in terms of what can be done. So what can we take, just looking at retrospect in, in terms of what Cradle's done and where we've been going. I think one of the really, really central things that makes everything work for us is we really value the importance of collaboration. We really value active networks and we really value sustaining them. And that means working within the team. Very rarely do we do things only on our own. In fact, when somebody has a, a single author publication, it's kind of something of interest and surprise. But people do, for example, Phil's book is an example of that. But by and large, most of our work is collaborative and it's within the team, with other colleagues at Deakin and with national 
and international collaborators. And I'm delighted with the number of different countries that we've been collaborating with just in recent times. You know, just to name a few, uh, Denmark, Spain, Chile, Canada, the US, Hong Kong, China. We've had collaborations with all of these countries or with researchers in these countries. Second thing I think we can take from our experience is the touchstone. And our touchstone is, will it make an educational difference? If we do this piece of work, will it lead to something worthwhile? So we're not um, pure researchers in the sense that we just investigate the phenomena of learning. We're interested in things that can, maybe not immediately, but with some easy adapt adaptation to make a difference. So our emphasis in terms of the approaches we use is our emphasis on the applicable, our emphasis on naturalistic rather than experimental studies. And our emphasis is also on writing things which can be understood by those not researching in the area. And this is an interesting tension for us because we want to get in the top journals, we get in the top journals in higher education, but we want to write in such a way that anyone can pick those things up and, and run with them. The other important thing about the kind of things we do is this aphorism from uh, Kurt Levine. There's nothing as practical as a good theory. So we do use theory a lot. And we see that as an absolutely fundamental part of the research that we do, because theory opens up possibilities. It provides a dialogue. It provides directions. It provides challenges. And the other important thing we should take from this is I've been involved in, in, in various centres and groups um, over a very many, a very long period of time. And Cradle works. And one of the reasons it works is the extraordinary support of management at Deakin. Um, their support, but not their direct intervention. So we talk about what we do, we listen to what's important, we try to focus on priorities but it works through the building of trust in both directions. And I think we can't underestimate the importance of that in higher education research. So the final slide before I open things up for discussion. So I think research is about reframing problems in useful ways. And a lot of what we're doing is that we're shifting the ways in which we think about things in order to focus on important aspects and to value things that really make a difference. In the feedback space, for example, it's shifting the focus just from inputs onto the overall process to focus on students' initiatives in feedback. And the same in all the other areas we've mentioned today. We also think that a theory practice divide is not productive. We do not do research which then gets put into practice. We want to do research that makes a difference, that is theoretically informed and makes a practical difference altogether integrated. Our challenge and the challenge of any group in this area is choosing the productive problems and choosing the productive problems is the art of doing research. It's not just the art of doing research in this area, is applicable across the spectrum. Um, and it's not just the art of the possible, but the art of the productive. And finally, um, attending to pressing problems is a really good starting point, but it's how we frame them that will make a difference. So that's looking back and just a little look to the future. We are very interested in having a dialogue with other researchers with practitioners about what are the important problems, what are the things that we should focus on, and trying to work out ways in which we can get some leverage, ways in which we can get a, a productive angle on them. And I hope we can continue some of this 
in our discussion. So over to you, Trina. Thank you, David. Um, I think that we've covered a lot of ground in the questions, I must say. There's going to be all sorts of things thrown at you, but I think it um, seems right to start with the most popular question, which I think you probably have begun to um, unpack when you were speaking about um, Cradle's um, emerging areas of new emphasis. But um, Lincoln James asked, what do you consider the big questions and challenges for higher education in the coming decade? <laughs> oh, just a little question. Just, just, a, just a small question. Um, the coming challenges, I think the, the obvious immediate coming challenge is the move back from being totally remote towards the blend of remoteness and togetherness. Um, what will campus learning look like in the future in a way that's digitally enabled? What will we be ditching from the old way of doing things? What will we be embracing? What will be the new practices that we will need to engage in for campus-based activities that really involve students in really meaningful ways? Well, I think we've got the message over a very long period of time that students don't like sitting passively in a large lecture theatre listening to someone else talk at them. What they like when they come to campus is they like to meet each other, they like to meet staff, they like to engage in things and they like it to be both a productive learning experience and a productive social experience. So I think that is one immediate thing that we've got to come to grips with as we kind of return to campus this year. And I think some of the other things have been touched upon by other speakers. I mean, Margaret's talked about the, the challenge of the digital. What does it mean that we are not just using the digital as a tool, but it pervades, it penetrates every single thing that we do in every single way. We can't talk anymore about face-to-face -face versus digital learning. That's a completely ridiculous dichotomy. So the issue is in any given situation, in any, any given context, how do these two things work seamlessly together? So, I don't know, I think one can go on and on. Um, so I'm very happy if any of my colleagues want to pick up on this thing. It's something we could talk about for the whole of the rest of our time. So thanks for the question, Lincoln. Okay, if no one wants to jump in and add to that large, that large list, uh, which is probably enough. Um, another area where we had a lot of questions was around impact. So both at the level of how does um, Cradle measure influence or impact, also, what impact do you see yourselves as having on both Deakin itself as an institution, so actual teaching practice and curriculum at Deakin beyond scholarship? And also there were some questions around, and I can come back to these to not give you too much at once. There were also some questions around whether Cradle works with government at all, or influences government policies and strategies. Um, and then there were also questions around the more forward thinking about how, and I might start with this one, if you like, <laughs> how feedback researchers can have even more impact on the practices of regular higher education teachers. So we can start at the beginning or the end, if you prefer, David, and I'll go through those questions again. Yeah, you, you, you might, there's too many questions all at once. You might need to prompt me. Yes. Uh, just just, just giving you a bit of an overview. So starting with maybe how, how Cradle measures influence, I think, would be useful. We, we, well, there's, there's, there's two in indicators. There's the conventional research center indicators that I've mentioned, which is papers in top quality journals and research income. And yes, we, we look at that and we got KPIs to do with that. The more important thing is Cradle was supported by Deakin because of the contribution he makes to Deakin. And it's quite complex. If Deakin is going to be seen to be the premier teaching and learning university in Australia, or, or more widely, then it also needs to be seen to be the premier teaching and learning research university in higher education in that context. So that it is a, to have a centre like ours is a necessary part of having a high profile in the quality teaching and learning space. So one of the things that we have to do is to work out what can we do for Deakin that is going to enhance that 
in the future. And we need to fit in very well with our colleagues in uh, Deakin Learning Futures that are supporting the everyday practice and the development practice of our courses right now. So the impact we have is through research, which means that there are researchers within faculties, researchers within DNF, that are moving forward where we are going. So collaborations, we measure, we measure our collaborations, uh, we measure the examples of differences that we make. We have our fellowship scheme, we have partnership fellowships in which we take an idea, for example, the idea about feedback, and with examples in key units in each faculty of develop people that will extend that research into particular units. And I mean, they're just examples of the kind of things that, that we try to do. Um, so it's, it's getting multiple contacts with multiple people in areas that are going to make the biggest difference. And for example, key first year classes um, is, is, a, is an area that we would want to place a more, prom more prominence on than like specialist final year subjects, for example. And as we're speaking, David, I'm thinking about the, the cradle guides, which are produced with um, Deakin staff, particularly in mind on how to translate that research into practice. And another question that we had, which was related, was does cradle provide training sessions to Deakin staff regarding, in particular, work on building feedback literacy with students and teachers? Yeah, uh, thank you, Trina, for that wonderful prompt to uh, draw attention to the cradle suggests. So we have these one page sheets which come out of our research which are kind of practical how to do it kind of guides. <coughs> Occasionally, and we've got one, one came out last year, looking at assessment in will, which is a more, ex more elaborated guide for how to develop good assessment practice in work integrated learning. Um, we don't run training sessions directly. We um, collaborate with DLF on training that they might offer, but we, pursue the dissemination of ideas through collaborative projects with staff, collaborative research projects, so that we try to make our work generally available. Um, but if we spent a lot of time running training sessions, then we wouldn't actually be moving the research agenda forward. So that is a fundamental tension in what we do. And we've given priority to moving the research forward because there are other people that are contributing to um, uh, the training front. And I think we're gonna see more interesting things emerging um, in that in the future. And so looking beyond Deakin, did you wanna say anything about whether you are able to work with government or influence you know, policy and strategies about the sector more broadly? Well, I, th I think the best example of that is what Phil uh, was talking about in terms of um, I think the work that Phil and his colleagues have done has directly influenced the legislation about contract cheating. Before um, those inputs, we were going to have legislation which was exposed that would lead parents of students to prosecution for helping them with their students' assignments. So we, we've had, kind of headed off some really bad practice um, and help formulate um, legislation that does make a difference. Now, that doesn't always occur. It, it, it occurred at a particular point in time because there was particular research on a very particular subject that the government was interested in developing legislation on. Now, there's all sorts of other things that the government is doing to change higher education that um, doesn't have such a precise focus and isn't, doesn't have such a kind of a pointy direction. So it's actually much more difficult for us and indeed any researchers to actually directly impact um, on the more general things that are occurring in higher education. And in fact, I mean, a lot of us would say that a lot of the things that we teach and learning, we don't want the government to intervene in directly. We don't want um, 
um, them to over influence their practice. We want them to provide a good framework. We want them to provide good legislation. We've got TEXA, we've got higher education standards, and we operate within that. But uh, more precise things are a bit risky because basically governments don't understand about how education works in general. And um, we should be very wary about having uh, too much of that direction um, impinge on us. Excellent. So now looking beyond just Cradle and for your general advice for higher education researchers in general, um, how can, how might feedback researchers in particular, the question from David Carlos says, how might feedback researchers have even more impact on the practices of regular higher education teachers? I, I think I'm going to pass it on to my colleagues because they need a kind of chance to ask, ask answer questions that are too hard for me. <laughs> Uh, who, who would like to pick up the feedback question, Phil? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, th I think it's a great question because I don't know. I think the feedback literature has a lot of things in it that may not be reflected in everyday uh, practice at the moment. I think some of it's that some of the feedback literature is hard to read. Uh, I'm going to say something controversial. I think the fact that we can't agree on a definition about feedback in the feedback literature makes it a hard literature for a practitioner to engage in. Uh, so I think it'd be nice if we found ways to make our, our work more accessible. Uh, I think also going back to some of the work that Margaret and I led around how academics do assessment work, you know, assessment design work, that sort of thing. When we talked with a lot of academics from several Australian unis about what influenced their assessment work, the peer reviewed literature did not really feature at all. Um, I think there were more references to workshops by David Bowd by name than there were two references to the, the feedback research literature. So I think we need to find ways to leverage the things that, that do influence people. And you know, the thing that really stood out to me in that project was uh, the person next door, the person in the office next door was orders of magnitude more powerful than any publication. So we need to find ways to get in there to the, the people next door, to the prominent practitioners. Yeah, I think Margaret. I, I agree. And something that I think is really interesting that we're, we've turned to, and Joe is doing this on our current Nishi project, is trying to build those collaborations with on the ground teachers into the actual research. So you start to spread it out that way as well, too. Um, because I agree with Phil. I mean, and, and, and the experience of Cradle has, I think, been one of collaboration and network, and it really shows the absolute power in it. And I think that by getting um, connections with people who are at the, the, the we can't call it the chalk face anymore, but um, it makes a huge, it makes a huge difference to how we both do the work, how what the work comes out like, because it's more relevant, but it also um, um, builds the impact as well. But Dave, David Cullis, I know you already do a lot of that. This question might tie in with that a little bit, Margaret. So you might want to add to this or others might like to jump in. But how do we advance feedback literacy when students are with us for such a short time is essentially the question. Um, and such a small amount of contact with per student is in our workload models. So, can I take that, Phil, as you're, yeah. you're yeah. leading a project on feedback literacy as we speak. Yeah, yeah. So um, recently submitted an ARC discovery application to try and, and do that, to try and see how can we sort of track this over time in terms of its development, uh, what sort of interventions might work to try and improve student feedback literacy, and how can we actually see it happen and ideally happen in the long term after students have left us and they're in the workplace. So from a, from a research perspective, I think we need longitudinal research that really tracks students over time because a lot of what we have in the research at the moment is short-term interventions. You know, I'm going to run something to develop students' feedback literacy and within the space of a small number of weeks, I'm going to 
see if they used some specific feedback that I wanted them to use. And I don't think that's, that's really good enough. Um, so I think we need some work that's about long-term impact, long-term effects. From a practical perspective, I think a great challenge that we have is individual uh, unit chairs, people running their own subject, do a change and then there's no other impact on the rest of the degree program. And I don't think there's any real impact. I think it'll take a maybe a set of people, the people who run first year, for instance, get together and try and just change the core first year units. I think that's a, an achievable thing that's going to be better than what we currently try and do. Can I, can I jump in? I, I also think it's detrimental for us to think of feedback literacy as something that is um, separate or devolved from feedback practices themselves. So if we design good feedback practices and use those as each interaction with a student as an opportunity to help them make sense of information and why they need that for their learning and to achieve their personal goals, as well as the learning outcomes for the unit of study, um, that, that becomes, they all become opportunities for building students' literacies in general about learning, about feedback, about feedback information, about seeking information. Um, and, and I think then perhaps the task becomes less, uh, less of a one-off at the beginning type thing and more of a, um, inter an intervention that we do with students continuously. Um, because I don't think that feedback literacy is transferable or generic because of the ways in which, the ways we deal with feedback is very situated. It depends on who it's from, what it's about, how, you know, what opportunities you have to then use that information. So I think good feedback design is really important to embed feedback literacy. Yeah, I, I think I think the 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 error that we need to avoid is thinking that we need all these extra measures to develop feedback literacy. What we need to do is to focus on what we're doing at the moment in our normal teaching and learning practices, in our normal feedback practices, and to adjust them in such a way that through each one of those acts of teaching, learning, assessment, feedback, we are developing the capacity of students to become more literate in the process. And, and can I make a comment, sorry, about time? I wrote a piece for Sally Kift and the CMM about time, and I've given hundreds of feedback workshops, and, you know, the, the question of time is real, and the issue of WAMs allocating three minutes to give feedback to a student for a piece of work. So when I was um, lead coordinator for a, a, a master's degree at Dundee, what we did was we decided we really, this idea of feedback at the end of a, a unit of study for a piece of assignment that they've already completed and gone on to something else really wasn't making us feel good, wasn't making the students feel good, wasn't in, in contributing to their learning. So I think rather than saying, oh, it's the time, we don't have enough time. What you need to think about is really how do you transform the assessment agenda in ways that enable you to have time to prioritise feedback for learning? And what we ended up doing is we reduced the total volume of assessments, if that is at all possible, and dedicated that time that was gained from reducing the total number of assessments in a unit of study and across a course into feedback processes that made a difference. And that was around formative, formative tasks or low stakes tasks early on that promote feedback that then sequences into other tasks. We developed a feedback portfolio that enabled students to then um, re-engage with comments to tell us how they use those comments. So it's not that you need time to give more feedback. I think that is the wrong way to think about it. What you need is, is, is time is to renegotiate the time and front end feedback into and to do feedback that makes a difference. And I think that's something that comes through our work quite strongly. Thanks, Rolla. So the other um, questions that we've had have been about where and why Cradle publishes. Um, in particular, is open access important? <laughs> um, we're, we're at a very interesting transition point in the open access world 
And in Australia, we are actually a very long way behind the rest of the world in terms of negotiating open access agreements. Um, what we have tried to do in the past is when we've had the funds available to make key papers open access. That has not been possible because of the budget constraints, uh, you know, last year and this year. Um, so, for example, unfortunately, some of our um, recent publications are not going to be um, open access. I think op open access is very desirable, but we have a dilemma in areas that are not well funded. And that is who picks up the cost of open access. So if you have to pay, I don't know, three and a half thousand, four thousand dollars to have your paper published, at the moment, you know, there, where's the university fund for providing that open access? Um, there's an awful lot of work that's been done overseas on Plan P or whatever um, that suggests how it can be done. There have been all sorts of negotiations between university systems and publishers about open access. And there is a real vacancy in that space in Australia. So yes, I very much support open access. Why do I not publish open access all the time? Because we cannot afford to publish in open access all the time. If we could, we would. So that involves massive changes in the funding model. And this goes to the funding of research in Australia, which is a huge, great problem in government funding. Thank you. So getting back to assessment, um, so anyone on the panel might want to answer this one. How do you see programmatic assessment across a course in terms of fostering evaluative judgment? Well, if no, if no one else is going to rush in, I'll, I'll kick off on that. <coughs> in order to develop evaluative judgment, you do need to do it across a course and you do need to do it over multiple units. One, one of the pieces of research I did, which was on self-assessment over time and over a whole degree program, suggests that students do improve the quality of their judgments of their own work over a course. That was without active interventions. With active interventions like developing uh, evaluative judgment type interventions, one would imagine that that can be done quite effectively. But what the question is pointing to is the the real hole in assessment, which is not looking at assessment on the basis of a program. We've got this traditional model in universities in which we kind of hand out the units to different staff members and basically say to them, well, you look after the assessment in your unit. And, you know, so long as it sort of generally fits in with the course as a whole, we're not too bothered. Whereas we're moving from that situation and some of the professions are moving much more rapidly, like medicine's moving much more rapidly in this direction towards looking at assessment for the course as a whole. Students get a degree in a particular subject area and it's their competence in that subject area that we need to be thinking about, not the particular assessments that idiosyncratically individual people that look after units might have focused on. So I think we do need almost a, a kind of revolution in the way we think about assessment so that the unit of analysis is the program um, which values that rather than the units of assessment, assessment within units adding up to produce something because every single curriculum mapping exercise that I've seen anyone do in any university, in any discipline, points out the massive, massive over-assessment of some learning outcomes and the complete lack of assessment of other learning outcomes. And we should learn by now that, you know, when we actually design our assessment on a unit by unit basis, we will find great chasms and we will also find great excesses. So we do need to shift the focus of our attention and to take programs, courses that is more seriously. I can just really briefly add something about the assessment security side of things. I think at the moment we try and 
stop people from cheating at every single active assessment that we do at a university. And that's a horrible experience. And if we took the sort of approach that Dave's talking about, in addition, it lets us identify those key moments of assessment that actually matter in terms of accrediting someone to have achieved the outcomes of the degree. And we can focus on not cheating in those and we can focus on you know, building academic integrity in the others as well. So there's so many different benefits to a programmatic approach. Bill, on, on cheating, we've had another question that's clearly for you. So regarding cheating experience and aftermath, do you think it's worth storytelling that experience um, to discourage cheating? Does that work? Yeah. I, I think we definitely need to do more of that. I think we need more honest conversations with students about that side of things. We know some things from our work, such as often contract cheating sites don't give you what you've paid for. Uh, the quality is really poor. Some research out of uh, Curtin tells us that students are getting blackmailed by these sites. We need those sort of honest conversations. Uh, when I was young, my parents had some very honest conversations with me about recreational drugs. And I think, you know, them telling me the, the honest real effects was quite powerful for me. And I think we need some similar conversations that are very frank and fearless with students about the dark side of some of this cheating as well. Thanks, Phil. I think this is a really important question. Does Cradle liaise with Indigenous research centres or otherwise have any Indigenous scholars or experts who integrate Indigenous ways of belonging, being and knowing? I think this came up in conversation the other day. Yeah, well, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very timely question because we're, um, we're, we're, we're actually, we've actually been talking about this very issue and uh, uh, discussing our links with Nikiri and uh, links with Mark... Um, What's Mark's name? Uh, Mark, Mark Rose. Mark Rose, yeah, um, about this. So this is something that we're actively wanting to explore right now, um, that we've only very indirectly had any contact in the past. I mean, there have been you know, occasional um, links, but I think it's something that we will want to, we are wanting to pursue more actively now. And if I might add, we are, we do, I'm very excited yeah, actually no, to get to work with people from Naikiri um, this year on um, uh, our development partners around inclusive assessment. And I think um, reflecting on this question, I think it's actually been also about us being credible assessment researchers for Indigenous peoples to want to actually work with us. So I think there has been, you know, we, we have needed the time to develop as well into people who are worthy of working with. So I'm hopeful that going forward that, yeah, we'll have much more to report about in this space. Okay, so what might authenticity be from the viewpoint of students? Rola, did you want to jump in on this one, Margaret? Um, well, I can, I can answer from what they told us in the study. And um, so there was a number of things that mattered to students in terms of the assessment, them perceiving the assessment to be authentic. First, that it actually allowed them to portray themselves and their goals and what they were hoping to achieve into their future. So some way of embedding and narrating and portraying their career identities and their hopes and aspirations. Another thing was around the ability of assessment to actually capture the enactments that they're doing in the workplace. So the range of activities, the, the practices that they're involved in, their achievements in the workplace in ways that are more timely, that are more um, realistic to how they're doing it. So for example, they critique the idea of, of only reporting their reflection, to, you know, on, of, of a, um, a teaching plan, but actually no one really, they weren't, a, no one saw them implementing and enacting the teaching plan. So the performance, as well as their reflections on the performance matter. And that's actually a critique of the reflection literature itself is that we think if they can reflect on something, it means they can do the thing, but actually reflection means that you can actually reflect or, or follow a model for reflection. And the third thing, and that was the final thing is who was doing the assessment. So they were quite critical when, um, 
their work placement supervisor, for example, was not involved in, in the assessment, in the act of assessment, in making judgments and offering feedback. Um, they thought that that really undermined um, what the work placement offered in, well, it undermined the assessment because it wasn't true to what they were doing out there in the placement and, and it was very much unicentric. So I think it kind of needs to engage both worlds meaningfully um, and whether it's a bridge between the two or it actually includes the two and allows students to portray what they, who they are and what they're doing more meaningfully. Thank I just you. wanted to add to that from a um, from a sim perspective, which is that I think one of the things and and authenticity in simulation is 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 quite fraught because sometimes if things are highly realistic, the simulation actually just doesn't work that well because the the, the students can't manage, so it's it's too much. And I think one of the jobs that you have is to um, provide a rationale, a persuasion to the students why it's relevant and what authenticity might mean to them and to also hear back of course from the students about what's relevant to them so it becomes a dialogue because um you know authentic doesn't mean real it means something for me it means something that resonates and it needs to resonate with both and so coming to that understanding together and the onus on us as educators and providing as not just saying that we say it's authentic therefore it is but to explain it to listen back and to come to some sort of mutual um, understanding about the topic I think is really important you see all the time in again in health professions people do assessments that they you know communication skills is absolutely uh, on point people don't think comm skills are important but they need to be persuaded as to why they are and why that is um, and an authentic um, moment for them for what their future practice will be so we're almost out of time i think we've got time for one or two more questions um, we've had a question about well, starting with there's been a trend to remove academic staff out of central units and to sort of separate those who do research into learning and teaching higher education from those who are involved in academic development, learning design. Um, but then we struggle to integrate those things. Um, what would you see as an ideal arrangement? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I, I feel that this issue has been... Um, Ever since I've been involved in uh, teaching learning units in higher education, which goes back a very long, long way indeed, this, this question has been on cycle. So every few years, a unit gets disestablished. Every few years, a unit gets its academic staff taken away and people converted to professional positions. Every few years, another unit gets established with academic positions and so on. So I'm not sure that there is any long-term trend if you look over a long period of time. There are more academics now in such positions than there were 30 years ago. Um, but also, I think one of the challenges is that the demands placed upon people in what you might call uh, academic development units is so broad that it's very difficult for them to develop research. So we have examples of notable individuals doing good research, but it's very difficult for there to be a critical mass of academics in any particular area that can make a difference. So my prediction is that this messing around will continue because when people get to senior positions, they do like to you know, make change the, re change the arrangements. Um, but I think what we have to do is that we have to collaborate in other ways. Now, there's a sufficient critical mass of researchers in Cradle for us to kind of build beyond ourselves. In any given university, there might be a few academics. And the only way that they're going to make a difference in research is by collaborating with other academics in other units in different institutions. And I think that that's something that we should be seeing a lot more of. But of course, I think we need to recognise that people in these roles are spread so thin that it's very difficult um, for them to find the space. So maybe we need to have a few more enlightened universities like Deakin that uh, 
support this more directly. Very good. So I think we probably want to um, not go into any more meaty questions. So perhaps a lighter question, which I was very popular, Dave. Um, <laughs> and I think it speaks to that impact and influence. So someone did ask when you'll be joining us on Twitter, hashtag get David Bowd on Twitter. <laughs> I keep having my arms twisted. I mean, this comes up time and time again. All my colleagues on the screen here at the moment would, would prefer this. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I have to say that I have a, a principled objection to being involved in social media of any kind. Twitter is probably the least worst of those, and maybe in the future I might be persuaded, but um, so long as my uh, colleagues are such good tweeters, then um, I feel the pressure slightly less. It was voted up six times, and I'm sure it wasn't just your colleagues, so just consider that slightly more arm twisting. Uh, um, but with that, I'd like to thank David Bowd, um, Phil Dawson, Joanna Tai, Margaret Beerman, and Rola Ajawi for contributing to the panel. It's been a really interesting discussion today, and thank you everyone else for all of the many questions that you have put to us. I think it's been very challenging and broad ranging. Thank you. Did you want to say anything to conclude, David? No, no, I, th I think we've had a nice broad ranging discussion. I'm very pleased and look to this space for what comes next. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. If you'd like to give them a virtual round of applause, I uh, don't think we actually have a clap button. Maybe we do. Um, thank you very much for participating in the session. Thank you, Trina. Later. Thanks, Trina. Bye.